How do you do? The man in this story never did drugs, never went to jail, and got drunk only once in his life. Yet, he was walking in darkness as surely as any blind man. His is an all-too-common story of practice without purpose. He needed to meet someone who could enlighten him, and when he did, his heart and mind and life were unshackled. This is Unshackled, true life stories of real people, dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Homeless people may be victims of the economy, of others, or themselves. No longer welcomed by families and friends, they wander the streets in despair. Pacific Garden Mission welcomes hundreds each day, offering food and a clean, safe bunk, all without charge. Even medical and dental treatment are free to residents at the old lighthouse. Showers and haircuts, fresh clothing spruce up the outer person, but it's the inner one that the mission wants to change. So counselors and pastors introduce them to someone who knows their anguish because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3146 in the series, Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Careful, Max. We don't want to have an accident getting to the doctor. We're almost there. Is he still bleeding? I can't tell. Nothing's coming out from under the bandage. You did a good job wrapping it. I was so scared. The way the blood was spurting out. Must have hit an artery. He stopped crying anyway. I thought he knew better. Fool thing to do. Stand up on a wheelbarrow like that. It's uh, stopped bleeding, but it's a deep puncture wound. What did he hit? A rusty bolt sticking out, Doctor. Now I'll have to give him a detonus shot then. You wouldn't believe how much it bled. Every time his heart beat, the blood sprayed out. Yeah, he had an artery in his temple. Could have been fatal. You did the right thing, Mrs. Seaford, wrapping it the way you did. I was very worried. How in the world did you think to press homemade bread and gauze against the wound? It was as if someone just told me to do that. The man in our story was that four-year-old boy who escaped a fatal injury. This is the testimony of how he learned who was guiding him through life. The true story of Dan Seifert, right now on Unshackled. I grew up on a farm near Haines, North Dakota, which is almost in the South Dakota. Dad had some cattle, but mostly he farmed winter wheat on nearly a thousand acres. In April each year we got 200 baby chicks, and my job was to feed and water them and clean the chicken house. I was the middle son with two brothers who also had chores. We all worked hard. Hey, Dad, can I go out with my friends tonight? You got all your chores done? Yes, sir. Where are you going? Over to Hettinger. Are you going to a movie, son? No, Mom. Me and my friends just want to go for a ride. Who's going to be driving? Russell. None of your friends drink, do they? We're not old enough, Mom. That doesn't stop some kids. No. Some of them smoke, too, but I think it's a waste of money. If you ever get arrested for drinking and driving, I won't bail you out, son. Dad's words scared me, so I didn't even taste beer until I was a senior in high school. Although we attended a mainline church, we never read the Bible or referred to God in our home. Our high school music teacher was a Christian and she taught us hymns of faith. Dad took me to a movie where the plane had engine problems and the passengers sang a hymn together. I wondered how to have such faith. I went to school all 12 years in Haines with only 16 boys in my high school. I graduated in 1962, one of six boys in my graduating class. Congratulations, Dan. You made it. I never had any doubts. Me neither. But young people sometimes get itchy feet. The draft board is going to be after me soon. You go to join the army? No. 
I'd rather join the Air Force. I love airplanes. That's fine, son. But can you wait till after harvest? So after harvest, I joined the Air Force. Basic training was not hard, but homesickness was. I was close to my family. The Cuban Missile Crisis hit, and we all feared imminent war until the crisis passed. I pulled an assignment to the command post at England Air Force Base in Louisiana, where I scored the bombing runs of F-100 fighter jets. A year later, President Kennedy was assassinated. The night before his funeral, my roommates returned from temporary duty elsewhere, bringing all kinds of liquor. What'll you have, Dan? Uh, a beer. A beer? We brought back all this booze and you're gonna have a beer, you pansy? Well, I, I've never drunk that stuff. Well, now's a good time to start. Call it a wait for the president. Oh, well, all right. Uh, I'll, I'll have a taste of each one. There you go. Good man. Well, uh, no, no, not, 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 not so much. Come on, Dan. Celebrate laugh. You never know when it's your time. Oh, no more for me. I'm not feeling well. I was there in Dallas, man. Saw him go by in that motorcade five minutes before the shooting. Uh, so real. First, they catch Oswald. Then Ruby shoots him. What next? Uh, I think I'm gonna be sick. That's what. I thought I would die that night and learn my lesson about drinking. Three months later, in mid-February 1964, my dad lay dying in a hospital back home. The Red Cross flew me there on emergency leave. It started last fall. He was always short of breath. It was all those cobalt treatments. But I thought cobalt was supposed to fight cancer. He had too many. 21 treatments last summer. It ruined his lungs. So that's why he's in an oxygen tank. He can't breathe, Dan. He's, he's suffocating. There's nothing they can do? They can't undo the damage. Now the fluid is building up in his lungs and he has pneumonia. <laughs> I don't want to lose him, Mom. I don't want to lose him either, son. I, I, I don't know what I'll, what I'll do without him. We watched as my dad slowly suffocated to death with double pneumonia. By the end of February, he was gone. I was totally devastated. He was only 49 years old. My brother was married and living in another town, and my younger brother, Don, was only 15. So the Air Force gave me a hardship discharge to help Mom with the farming. I really appreciate all your hard work, Dan. We had a good crop this year. Good thing Don stayed to help with the harvest after he graduated. I hate to see him leave and go into the Navy. It's a rite of passage, Mom. Every man has a duty to serve his country. But it puts all the work on you. Oh, I don't mind. But I'm going to start college. You're leaving? Well, during the week I'll be up in Dickinson, but I'll be home on weekends to help around here. I sure don't want to be a farmer all my life. I started college in the fall of 1966, majoring in business with a minor in social studies. I still went to church, but it had no real meaning. The emptiness I felt had grown over the years, and nothing filled it. In the fall of 1969, I took a class in child psychology. One morning, I walked late into class and nearly tripped over a girl's feet. And that's when I noticed Maggie. I didn't mean to embarrass you, Dan. <laughs> I can handle it. Why were you late for class? Well, it's a two-hour drive from our farm near Haynes. You're a farmer. Well, not if I can help it. That's why I'm studying business. Why are you taking child psychology, then? Well, the same principles apply, don't you think? Well, I'm a nursing major, so it's required. I minor in psychology and sociology. So you live here during the week? Yeah. Hey, um, maybe we can go out sometime, Maggie. Oh, look at that cute little boy over there. You really like children, don't you, Maggie? Very much. But then I came from a family of 11 kids. I like all the little critters. I used to take care of the baby chicks and loved it. We used to have a kitten, and when I milked the cows, it sat there waiting. I would aim the milk right into its little open mouth. How cute. I've always wanted to run an orphanage. Wouldn't that be fun? Managing the business would be interesting. You could manage the kids. 
Sounds ideal, Dan. I proposed to Maggie a year after we met, and we married in June 1971. She was 26 and I was 27. I continued to work my parents' farm for another two years. Oh, I'm glad the harvest is done. Me too. You know, Mom's leaving the farm. Where's she going? She's been offered a housekeeping job in New Salem. Well, that would be a lot easier than keeping up this farm. Yeah. I'm glad she's getting away. What about us? Well, how would you like to move to Rapid City? Really? Ooh, they had terrible floods in the spring. Oh, that's over with now, Maggie. Well, what about the farm? We can rent it out. So we all left the family farm in the fall of 1972. I worked at an optical shop in Rapid City for six months, and then I worked for an insurance company affiliated with a nationwide department store. By 1975, we realized we weren't having the babies we wanted, so Maggie's doctor did some tests. All the tests came back negative, Dan. <sighs> well, at least there's nothing wrong with us. No. Then why aren't we having babies? No one knows. I'm sorry, honey. I know how much you want a baby. <sighs> the doctor said we might as well adopt. Very shortly, we'll hear about Maggie's and Dan's choice. We publish some unshackled radio dramas as booklets, and we'd like to offer you one free. Just write and ask. Let us know what subject is of interest. All of the booklets are listed in our free resource catalog, so you can order by name or by number. Each booklet retells an unshackled drama, just as it was broadcast, complete with a prayer of salvation at the end, so anyone can be saved. Enjoy reading your copy and then give it to someone else, as the Lord leads. People who can't or don't go to church may read one of these stories, so they're a great evangelical resource. Some people purchase a sample pack of all of our booklets and give them away as gifts to loved ones, to the homeless, or the elderly at nursing homes. To get your free booklet or resource catalog, write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address, unshackled at pgm.org. We began working with an adoption counselor in the church and filled out the paperwork to adopt a baby. The first time the counselor came to our home, Maggie was so nervous and excited she burned the corn she was cooking. We passed all the hurdles and waited to hear from them. Hello? Yes? Uh, let me ask my husband, but I'm sure he'll say yes. Dan? Yeah. It's our adoption counselor. Would you be willing to accept a baby born on the reservation? <laughs> yes, of course. Did you hear him? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Dan! <laughs> We're going to be getting a baby boy, one month old. He's part Sue. <laughs> We were the last non-Indian people to adopt from that reservation, and we thought our infant son was the most beautiful baby in the world. A year and a half later, we moved back to Bismarck to be near our families, and I went to work with a big insurance company. We tried to transfer our adoption file from Rapid City to Bismarck, but the counselor asked us to wait. In March, she called us. Maggie, we're having a potluck this weekend for adoptive parents. Would you and Dan like to join us? Oh, we'd love to, but Dan just got back from insurance school in Nebraska. Would you like to drive down tomorrow and pick up your new daughter? Bring lots of ribbons because she has a full head of hair. I'm so excited. I just dropped my glass coffee pot. Yes, we'll be there. <laughs> Our baby daughter, seven days old, was half French and half Irish. In the summer of 1978, Maggie had pain in her chest and met her doctor at the hospital. Turned out she was expecting our own homegrown baby. 
Maggie's pregnancy was so fragile she wasn't allowed to leave the city, but our daughter arrived in November, making our three children two years apart. About that time, I learned of a new Christian radio station in our area, and I began listening while driving home. Remember when you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Have you ever noticed how often the Bible says, but God, but God led, but God delivered, but God is the judge. One of the most beautiful verses is this one. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And now here in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 we read, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. I had never heard the Bible explained like that and I listened whenever I could. I was reminded of the songs we were taught by the music teacher and the words of the song sung by the passengers in that movie. Could I have such confidence? Why was I here on earth? Surely there was a purpose other than work and family. Most of the radio preachers emphasized serving God, but I didn't want to go to a foreign country. Months passed as I pondered these things. One evening, Maggie's brother invited us to go with him to hear a speaker. Yes, I had a message all prepared, but the Holy Spirit has led me to give my testimony. You see, you see, before I was saved, I was a hopeless alcoholic. I lost my family because of my drinking and knew I couldn't change. Well, one night in despair, I drove 80 miles an hour into a bridge. If I had died, I would have gone to hell, but God spared me. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11 says, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Amen. Well, I survived, and, and I lay in the hospital where someone told me about Jesus, how he could change my life. I put my trust in Christ Jesus, and I was born again. God wants to give you new life, too, but you must be born again. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you understand all that? Some of it. I thought he was going to promote some product. Oh, Dan. Well, that's what they do on radio and TV. They give testimonials about vitamins or products that heal an upset stomach. Well, that's what he did too, Dan. Gave a testimonial about God. How Jesus healed his wasted life. I guess you're right. In you know, that business about being born again, do you understand that, Maggie? A little. I think my brother and his wife are born again. They've changed. They seem to have such peace and joy. I have to learn more. Maybe that's what's missing in my life. The more I listen to Christian radio, the greater the conviction. Day and night I thought about my need for a relationship with God. And one day, while driving alone, I pulled to the side of the road, closed my eyes, and prayed. Lord, I come to you in repentance of my sins. I give you my soul. I give you my heart, and I give you my total being. Now, I'm going to be like David of old. I am coming after you with all my heart. And if we are to be missionaries to Africa, then you will make Africa look so good that we can't wait to go there. When I opened my eyes, even the trees looked different. But I was afraid to say anything to anyone. A few days later, I sat at my desk telling God I didn't know any other Christians with whom to fellowship. A few hours later, my nephew Tom walked in with the Bible. Hey, Uncle Dan. You'll never guess what happened to me. I'm saved. You are? Well, so am I, just last week. No kidding. I was telling God a few hours ago that I didn't know any Christians. And he sent me here. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful, isn't it? 
I wanted to show you some hot Bible verses, my favorite ones. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Isn't that fantastic? I can't wait for Jesus to return. We won't be the same. Let me write that down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52. And here's some more. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Wow! I never heard that before. Here's another one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I still marvel at the way God answered my prayer. That was the start of a five-year mountaintop walk with God in a Bible-believing church. And then I began teaching Sunday school. What are you teaching tomorrow, Dan? The story of Joseph. He's a type of Christ, persecuted, rejected, but chosen by God to deliver his people. I love this verse where he says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. God is always working in our lives, and we don't see till later what he's up to. You've always been sensitive to the Lord, Maggie. I knew the Lord in grade school, had a teacher who taught Bible verses and Bible songs. I wish my brother Don was more open to the gospel. He's just not interested. Don had served in Vietnam, came home and joined the police force in Mandan. Meanwhile, I served on the board of the Christian radio station where I learned to pray with godly men, one of whom was a police chaplain. Wayne and I both prayed for my brother, but Don resisted. I hope you're not going to start talking about God, Dan. Well, not if you don't want me to. I don't. The police chaplain is always here trying to sell me on Jesus. Walter? Well, he's on the board of the radio station. He comes by every night to read a verse of scripture, as he puts it, and then he prays for me. Here at home? Yes, here at home. Every night. Talk about persistence. Well, he loves the Lord, Don. It's not for me. But I have to admit, I appreciate his prayers. Why? Is something wrong? I have cancer, probably due to my exposure to Agent Orange. Walter continued to stop at Don's home for a year as he lay dying. Every family should have someone like Walter. Finally, he made a profession of faith in the Lord. Yes, it's true. Jesus saved me, Dan. Praise God. I've been praying for you. I was a hard case. I'm sorry I fought it so long. God's timing is perfect. I don't think I have very long, Dan. You can't lose, brother. We walk by faith, not by sight. I'm learning that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know a lot about the Bible. No. I'm still learning. Every day. But I never doubt that Jesus loves me and hears my prayers. Read me some of your favorite verses. Think of it. I used to resent Walter coming by to read <laughs> scripture. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You didn't even have to read that one. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it doesn't return to him void. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Don died six weeks after he was saved. I praise God for the times we prayed as brothers in Christ. He was only 42 years old. Our three children grew up, married, and have children of their own. 
All of the grandchildren said you're teaching them to memorize Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. I am. Why that particular verse? Because it's powerful. Everyone should know that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. You're right. Only God's truth can combat the lies of evolution. Later, I'm also going to teach them what Jesus said to his disciples. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Did you know that Michelle is going to adopt a child from Haiti? Really? Yes. They've started the process. No, Maggie. We started the process many years ago. <laughs> yes. We talked about running an orphanage someday. Well, with 12 grandkids, we have a good start. In 2003, my mother died, and we sold the farm to my nephew. I still work for the insurance company, but our real work has been to share Jesus with anyone we can. Knowing Jesus Christ is the best thing you can experience in your life, and it's for eternity. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. The Bible declares in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived and died for you, listening friend. He rose from the dead and lives to make intercession for you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you need help in making this crucial decision, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607.